This is Mises Weekends with your host, Jeff Dice. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Mises Weekends. We're joined by a good friend of ours, Caitlin Long. I always feel like I'm in the mafia when we talk about friends of ours. You know, uh, Caitlin is uh, chairman and president of Symbiont, which is a distributed ledger company uh, involved in smart contracts. So to the extent such a thing exists, she is a blockchain vet. Uh, <laughs> but she's also a Wall Street vet. She spent uh, like, uh, about 20 years, I guess, at uh, Morgan Stanley, Credit Suisse, Solomon Brothers. Uh, she has a law degree from Harvard Law School and also a degree from the Kennedy School of Government. But much more importantly and much better, uh, she is a University of Wyoming cowboy. So yeah. we like that. The, yeah. Harvard, the Harvard stuff we can do without. <laughs> um, but, you know, first of all, thanks for your time. You know, what's, what's happening in the blockchain sphere with, with your company and with some others is, is so interesting to us. Um, let me ask you sort of big picture to begin with. A lot of what we think about in the, the old economy, the, the non-digital economy, is middlemen, right? Sure. Intermediaries. So on, a, on kind of a big picture conceptual level, a lot of what blockchain does is eliminate intermediaries. So can you talk about that a bit? Sure. Uh, I, the way I like to phrase it is that the financial industry, when it started to digitize, it digitized the existing old legacy workflows and didn't really truly get the benefits of digitization because digitization un- enables completely changing the old workflows and streamlining the old, the old workflows. And so those early digitization efforts in the industry to the extent that they just merely locked in legacy workflows that were a function of technology limitations or regulatory limitations that applied 40 years ago, they didn't really help the industry that much. And so this new technology admittedly isn't necessary to streamline everything, but uh, it, it has it has become the impetus for change. And it's fascinating to see how much it has actually been a true impetus for change. Well, Okay, so you're a lawyer, um, and, and as you understand, a lot of what lawyers do uh, relates to mistrust on some level, right? There's both in the transactional setting when you're creating a contract or even when things devolve into litigation. Uh, when strangers enter into business arrangements, there's a level of mistrust. Uh, what, what, is, what does blockchain technology mean uh, or, or what can it do to sort of help us overcome this this problem that seems to be inherent in human nature. Well, it creates trust among peers. And ultimately, that's what this technology provides, is a a way for peers who either partially trust each other or don't trust each other or maybe don't even know each other to be able to interact and trust that their transactions are happening on a valid basis or that the information that they're they're drawing down from the Mm -hmm. distributed ledger is itself valid because it was added to the distributed ledger by participants who play by the rules of the network. And so it is uh, capable of replacing institutions as trust. And frankly, I think a lot of folks in today's world trust math more than they trust institutions, because institutions are fallible, they have a finite life, they are ultimately at the end of the, end of the day people. The laws of math are infallible, and that is at bottom what makes this technology better and able to replace humans and institutions as centers of trust. So if you were talking to someone, a stranger, um, how how would you describe Symbiont and how would you describe Symbiont's, uh, you know, a a target customer? Uh, We are an institutional distributed ledger company that uses smart contracts to uh, automate business processes. We are, unlike uh, the public blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum, we are a private distributed ledger company. And we, we've we done that for one simple reason, which is that institutions for anti-money laundering and know your customer requirements and, and really just um, identity are, are really struggling with using the public distributed ledgers. I personally think they'll get there someday, but uh, but for now, it, it's, a, it's a very, very high bar. And so, uh, so, so we are, in a way, an intermediate step in the sense that um, 
some folks give a, an analogy of intranets that companies started right. to adopt intranets with these big walled gardens before they actually tore down the walls and truly opened up their platforms to the internet, and at which point you saw just a flourishing of, of human creativity. I think we will go through that, but that's a 20-year process. Uh, and in the, in the meantime, institutions really truly do want to know who they're dealing with and understand that their counterparties have been vetted, they're permissioned, they are agreeing to play by rules. Now, that said, um, we are very different than a lot of the, uh, the industry-sponsored um, per, what's called permissioned distributed ledgers in the sense that we are decentralized. So we are permissioned but decentralized. That's a really important distinction because some of these other platforms are per permissioned and centralized, okay. which means that there is a trusted third party sitting in the middle validating transactions, um, seeing all of the data. Our network is very much consistent with the ethos of the public distributed ledger projects, which is decentralization. It's just that it's institutional peer-to-peer -peer involvement as opposed to anyone in the public uh, being involved in the network. That's the really the biggest distinction. Well, I mean, let's just take a common example. And this, this might re relate more to blockchain generally than to Symbiont. Uh, you know, to standard real estate deal. Someone's buying a house. Yep. The, the, the seller needs, we have to go into this escrow process, which from my perspective, hasn't changed much in 30 years. Oh, no. And, and so the, the <laughs> seller the has to know that the money is there. And yep. the buyer has to know that the title is good and clear. Yep. So so how how does blockchain help us help us do a simple housing deal without all this rigmarole? Well, it's fascinating because uh, if we can get everything on the ledger, so the entire loan file exists on the ledger, all of the participants are signing documents, uploading uh, documents, and it's all in one place. Mm -hmm. Then what happens is you can not only have what's called delivery versus payment, so you can actually exchange, to your point, you, the, the funding happens at the point in time when the exchange of value occurs, whereas right now that, that, that tends to be separated by at least a couple of days. But, but more importantly... The loan file's in one place. Right now, believe it or not, we, we did look into this. In the mortgage market, a physical loan file, you're, you're, you're the borrowing uh, all of your documents for your mortgage, changes hands three times before yeah. between the point in time at which the loan is originated and its final resting place in a securitization pool. It, it, the physical loan file is FedExed or messengered between oh the financial God. institutions three times. That's still today. Right. So, you know, there are certain parts of the financial industry that haven't been digitized at all. Um, now, we have not decided to pursue the mortgage opportunity sim simply because it's just too fragmented. The data is mm. just in too many places. There are network effects that these uh, technology platforms require. And so it's the syndicated loans project that we've announced just on Thursday um, is actually a, uh, a, a, I think, in some ways, a beta test for the banks because that's a syndicated loans are it's an institutional marketplace. Um, only institutions transact in those. You can of course, as an investor, invest in a loan mutual fund, um, but your, the, your, your mutual fund manager would be the institution who would be the participant in the market on your behalf. Uh, and, and that's it, it's a small enough market, but yet it's, it's decentralized enough that the characteristics fit very nicely with this technology. And uh, our announcement was that 19 financial institutions participated in a, a prototype, and there were actually 15 different institutions in the demo themselves who actually entered data and had a role to play in the in the demo. Um, so it's a very broad participation from the banks, and I think this is kind of a beta test for the banks eventually to take this technology to the consumer markets like the the residential mortgage market. So I, it'll probably be a good five to 10 years. Um, again, it's going to start in the easier, smaller markets. When I say smaller, not by dollar amount necessarily, but by right. number of participants who can create that network. Okay. Well, you know, we can talk about a real estate contract. Let's talk about Wall Street. Let's talk about equities and bonds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, you're, you're, you are a, a colleague in a sense of, of uh, Patrick Byrne, who has obviously done a lot yeah. of work around the DTC. Yeah. I'm sure a, a lot of our listeners are familiar with the concept of the DTC and, and yeah. the fact that you don't actually own 
uh, the stocks or, or, or bonds in your brokerage account. There, you, you're the beneficial owner of them, but not the legal owner of them. So there's this this enormous middleman. And uh, unlike yeah. the the mortgage industry, where they're scattered far and wide, uh, yep. here you do have sort of one repository. And and talk about counterparty risk. Uh, what, yeah. what could what could blockchain mean for investors? Well, ultimately, blockchain is going to mean that you actually own the securities in your brokerage account. <laughs> um, and we don't own them right now. What we have, just like with our bank accounts, we, we've lent those assets to the counterparty. In this case, we're talking about a brokerage firm as opposed to a traditional bank. In the case of money, you don't own the bank deposits in your bank account. You've lent them to the bank. In your brokerage firm, you don't own the shares. You've lent them to your brokerage firm, who lent them to a custodian, who lent them, who, who borrowed them from the Depository Trust Corporation. It works very similar to the structure of the banking industry, and that creates a lot of problems. And there was just, um, I just today was reading an article that the New York Times put up a, a few days ago, um, and and there was quite a bit of uh, press coverage of, of this same story, which is the Dole Food case. Mm -hmm. There were 49 million valid claims filed, but only 36 million shares outstanding. <laughs> and so um, it, 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 that's like what, it, one of those nightmare scenarios where you yeah. think you own what you thought you owned and suddenly an extra 25% show up and claim um, at, with valid claims to what you thought you owned and, and then you're, you're going to be diluted down. And it's fascinating to see how the industry is going to deal with this because a Delaware court judge kicked it back to the broker dealers and said, you go figure this out. Uh, and it's not going to be easy for the broker dealers to get some of the cash back that they've already paid out to short sellers uh, three years later. So long story short, I think the broker dealers are going to, are going to be taking it, taking it on the chin. And uh, just as the story I, I read today said, look, that they should. This is their problem. They created this issue. They need to figure out how to fix it. Uh, I think blockchain technology is the fix to this. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, we have a very, very tremendous partner, which is the state of Delaware. Um, the state of Delaware has actually got something called the blockchain, Delaware Blockchain Initiative, and my company is a technology provider, the right. uh, technology partner to that. Now, I think even the purest um, anarcho-capitalists would would agree that um, that that registry of property and resolution of disputes surrounding registry of property is a legitimate function for government. So I think even the purists would look at this and say, "Gosh, that's that's uh, we sure. approve." Um, and uh, the the minarchists certainly would approve. But uh, needless to say, um, Delaware got interested in this technology pretty early on, and they just two weeks ago released a proposal to permit Permit distributed ledger registrations in uh, uh, in the state of Delaware. It's a very important state. Almost 85% of new incorporations in the U.S. happen in the state of Delaware, in part because there is such a well-developed um, registry, but also body of corporate law and litigation history right. surrounding the exact uh, uh, requirements uh, of of administering a corporation. So watch for more to come in that in that area. But we actually have a believe it or not a government that is that is more innovative and more um, and, and moving faster than a lot of private uh, uh, sector institutions on this very front. Um, and, and there's a lot to come out of the state of Delaware that I, that, uh, I really take my hats off to them. Uh, we are their partners. Um, right. uh, we were, we, it was my, my company's uh, founder's idea to approach them with this idea. And at the time, the governor, uh, who's an ex-McKinsey consultant, understood exactly what the opportunity was, both for Delaware and for cleaning up the back office of Wall Street. He got it very quickly and said, yes, this is something Delaware should get behind. So we've already mm. rolled out our technology at the Delaware Public Archives. So uh, they are in the process of, um, of uploading data to, uh, to our, our platform. Um, and, uh, uh, and then uh, as of, of August 1st, presuming that the legislature approves the change to Delaware corporate law, it will be recognized as a legal registration of a corporation in Delaware if the company is registered on a distributed ledger. And just to finish the thought, 
the the very the, the the really important takeaway from that is that once a company registers on a distributed ledger, there is no piece of paper that can sit at the DTC and right. uh, and uh, and therefore you you essentially uh, completely change the plumbing of the securities industry and allow record owners to be beneficial owners of shares again. And the Dell situation, or sorry, the Dole situation. There was also a Dell case too. So uh, Dell and Dole happened to uh, have similar cases with problems between the registered owner of securities and the uh, beneficial owner of securities. Once that uh, that system is in place in Delaware, those two can be brought back together again. So you have no intermediaries and you have clear property rights in the securities that you own in your brokerage account again. But then also imagine an, an individual Dole owner could sell some shares to an individual Dole buyer. That's it. That's exactly right. This facilitates peer-to-peer in, in investment. Now, of course, it's still going to have to go in a in the in a public securities situation. It would still right. have to go through a registered, right. um, you know, regulated uh, part of of the industry. Uh, but there are a lot of things happening in in the private securities market, right. and we're working on a number of those as well. Um, that uh, uh, where where it could literally be a peer-to-peer exchange. Well, that's. I hope that that is coming. Uh, but it sounds like Delaware is doing what the federal government is not. Uh, it, you know, as, as I'm sure you're aware, a couple of years ago, the IRS issued some guidance about the tax treatment of, of Bitcoin, for example. Uh, more recently, we've seen the SEC uh, deny registration on the New York Stock Exchange to a couple of, mm-hmm. of uh, Bitcoin-related ETFs. Uh, Bitcoin is kind of a separate question, but, but let me ask you this. Congress... Uh, statutorily, not at the administrative level, but but to, to my knowledge, Congress is not really enacting any legislation w- w- with respect to to cryptocurrencies or blockchain technology. Am I wrong? That's right. There is a Congressional Blockchain Caucus, right. and it's bipartisan. There's a both a, a Democrat and a Republican chairing it, and part of their uh, stated mission is to enable this innovation to flourish. Uh, and so uh, there, there has there there's not been any legislation passed uh, at the congressional level that that would impede this innovation, which is a which is a terrific outcome. Yeah, let's keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to leave you with one last question, Caitlin. You poured a lot of your life and your energy <laughs> into into blockchain technology and thinking about it and working within it. You you left uh, what I imagine was a lucrative Wall Street career. You know, getting back to those middlemen, those intermediaries, whether we're talking about government or banks or uh, middlemen of all kind, do you ever lose a little sleep wondering if <laughs> if they're not going to go quietly into the night, but rather they're going to fight this when it as the as it grows? And and it's sort of like Uber; it's so obviously and evidently a good thing <laughs> that the only people who could be against it are the people who might be financially you know injured by. It. Does that cause you any heartburn? Well, we think about it, obviously, but the value proposition of what we're bringing to the table is so clear that the participants in the market in where we've actually been engaged have been very clear to support it. Uh, and um, so syndicated loans is a perfect example. That's that's a market where banks and um, investment firms interact with each other. Both sides agreed that for a whole host of both cost and regulatory reasons, that change was necessary. So uh, so the the ball got rolling and, um, and you know, that's a market that, that kind of like the mortgage market hasn't really been digitized yet. So the case for change was pretty clear. Um, in some other markets, I think it's going to take a lot longer and there will be uh, there will be more friction. It won't be such an obvious case. But the way I think about it as a business person is if we if we generate value to customers, then customers will buy the product. And we have to prove that there is value. We have to prove that uh, that there are costs that can be taken out or that there are, there are new products that can be created as a result of deploying the technology. And I think in the, at the end of the day, the market wins. Uber proved that they could take on the, the taxi and limousine commissions because they develop, they deliver a product that is just that much better and consumers voted with their feet. And I think the, the analogy will be true here as well. I'm not suggesting that we think it's going to be a uh, an easy road, but but we're very targeted in in the opportunities that that we're pursuing, uh, and 
we think that the securities industry will end up moving over to the distributed ledger solutions, but I, I don't think it's going to be fast. And I think, ironically, public equities might actually be the last product to convert over to distributed ledger technology. And that that may take 20 years. Look at look at where we are with loans just getting started. So uh, it, it's going to take some time, but I think we're going to get there. And I think in the meantime, that, we're, that these technologies are going to bring a lot of value to the participants in the markets. Well, Caitlin Long, President, Chairman of Symbiont, thanks so much for your time. It was great seeing you again. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend. Subscribe to Mises Weekends via iTunes U, Stitcher, and SoundCloud, or listen on Mises.org and YouTube.